live from Boston, Massachusetts, it's theCUBE, covering OpenStack Summit 2017. Brought to you by the OpenStack Foundation, Red Hat, and additional ecosystem support. Hi, welcome back. I'm Stu Miniman, joined by my co-host, John Troyer, and happy to welcome back to the program, Brian Stevens, who's the CTO of Google Cloud. Uh, Brian, thanks for joining us. I'm glad to, it's been a few years. All right, I, I want to bounce something <laughs> off you. So, we always talk about, you know, it's like open source. You worked for, you know, in, in the past, what is most considered the most successful open source company for monetizing open source, which is Red Hat. We have posited at Wikibon that it's not necessarily the company, it's not only the companies that sell a product or solution that make money off it, but I said, if it wasn't for things like Linux in general and open source, we wouldn't have a company like Google. So, you know, you agree with that? Or you look at the market cap of a Google, I said if we didn't have Linux and we didn't have open source, Google probably couldn't exist. Yeah, I don't, I don't think any of the hyperscale yeah. cloud companies would exist without open source and Linux and, and Intel, right? I think it's, it's a big part of the stack, absolutely. Yeah. All right, you, you made a comment at the beginning about you know, what it means to be an open source person working at Google. Uh, the joke we, we all used to make was uh, the rest of us are using what Google did 10 years ago, um, ah. and eventually it goes from that white paper all the way down to some product that you used internally, and then maybe it gets spun off. I mean, we wouldn't have Hadoop if it wasn't for Google. Uh, you know, just some of the amazing things that have come out of you know, th those people at Google. But what, what, what does it mean to be open source at Google and with Google? Well, you get both. Right, because I think that's the that's the fun part. Is I don't think a week goes by where I don't get to discover something coming out of a research group somewhere. You know, now the latest is machine learning. You know, Spanner because they learned how to do distributed time synchronization across geo data centers. Like, who does that, right? But but Google has both the people and the desire and the ability to invest in on the research side. Um, and then sort of then you marry sort of that innovation with everything that's happening in open source. It's a really a perfect combination. And, and so instead of building these proprietary systems, it's all about how do we actually not just contribute to open source, but how do you actually build that interoperability framework? Because you don't want cloud to be an uh, island. You know, you want it to be really integrated into developer tools, databases, infrastructure, et cetera, right? Yeah, and a lot of that sounds like it plays into the Kubernetes story. Is you know, Kubernetes is a piece sure. that, that allows some similarities between wherever yeah. you place your data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and you know, maybe to give, give us a little bit more about what Google. You know, how do you decide what's internal? I think about like the Spanner program, yeah. uh, which there's some other open source pieces coming up. Look like they read the white paper and yeah. are trying to do yeah, some yeah. pieces. Yeah. What, you, you said less white papers, more code coming out of Google. Well, how does that? What does that mean? It's not that we'll do less white papers. I mean, it's just the fact because white papers are great for research and Google's definitely a research, you know, strong academic oriented company. It's just that you need to go further as well. And so so that was, you know, what I was talking about like with gRPC, creating an Apache project, I think was the first time for streaming analytics, right? It was the first time that I think Google's done that. Um, obviously been involved for years at Linux kernel, compilers, etc. Um, yeah, the I, so I think I don't think it's I think it's more around um, um, you know, what do developers need? What areas, where, where can we actually contribute to areas? Because what you don't want, what we don't want is you're on premise and you're using one type of system, then you move to Google Cloud, and it feels like there's impedance. You're really trying to you know, get rid of the impedance mismatch all the way across the stack. And one of the best ways you can do that is by contributing you know, new systems designs. There's a little bit less of that happening in the analytics space now though. I think the new ground for that is everything that's happening in machine learning. You know, with TensorFlow, et cetera. Yeah, uh, absolutely. There, there was mentioned in the keynote this morning, all of the AI and ML, I mean, you know, Google with TensorFlow, even Amazon themselves, you know, getting involved more with open source. Yep. Um, you said you couldn't build the hyperscales without them, but is that the, do they start with open source, do you see, or? Um, well, I think at most people are, you know, running on a Linux backplane, right? I mean, it's a little bit different at Google because we got an underlying provisioning system called the Borg. You know, and that just works. So some things work, don't change them. The areas where you really want to um, be open source first are areas that are just under active evolution, because then you can actually conjoin that movement of active evolution. And like developer tools are kind of like that. You know, even in even in machine learning, you know, like machine learning is super strategic to just about every company out there. Um, and and but what Google did by actually open sourcing TensorFlow 
is now they created a, a canvas, that community, I mean, we talk about that here, but for data scientists to collaborate. And these are people that didn't do much in open source prior, but you've given them that ability to sort of come out with the best ideas and to innovate in code. I wanted to ask a little bit about uh, the, the enterprise, right? We could all make jokes sure. about enter you know, enterpriseiness is, is uh, well, you know, what everybody should have been doing, you know, but, but they're, you know, 10 years ago and they're finally getting to. But on the other hand, you know, Red Hat, very enterprise-focused company. OpenStack, uh, service provider and very enterprise-focused. Uh, one of the things that, that Google Cloud is doing, uh, well, I guess the criticism has typically been, uh, you know, how does, how does Google as a company and as a culture and as a cloud focus on the enterprise, especially bringing you know, advanced topics like uh, machine learning and things mm -hmm. like that, which to a traditional IT person are a little foreign. So yeah. I just am interested in kind of how you're viewing, how do we approach the needs of the enterprise, meet them where they are today, while yet giving them a, an access to a whole set of services and tools that are actually sure. going to take them into a business transformation stance. Sure. And that's because you end up, you know, as a public cloud provider with the enterprise, you end up having multiple conversations, mm -hmm. right? You certainly have one of your audience, your, primary audience is the IT team, right? And so you have to earn trust, you know, and help them understand sort of the tools and your strategy and your commitment to enterprise. And then you have CISOs, right, and the CEO that's worried about everything security and risk and compliance, which is a little bit different than the IT department. And then what's happening with machine learning and some of the higher services is now you're actually um, building solutions for lines of business. So you're not talking to the IT teams with machine learning and you're not talking to the CISOs. You're really talking around business transformation Right, and it's and and when you actually, you know, if you're going into healthcare, or if you're going into financial, you're it's a whole different team when you're talking about machine learning. So what happens is, um, you know, Google's really got a, a segmented, you know, you know, three three sort of convers just you know discrete conversations that happen at separate points of time, um, but all of which are um, enterprise focused because they all have to marry together. Because you even though there may be interesting machine learning, if you don't wrap that in an enterprise security model in a way that IT can sustain and enable and deal with identity and all the other aspects, then you know, you'll come up short. Yeah, uh, building on that, you know, one of the critiques of OpenStack for years has been it, it's tough. Uh, and I, I think about one of the critiques of Google is like, oh well, you know, Google builds stuff for Google engineers and you know, we're not Google engineers. You know, Google's got like the smartest people and therefore you know, we're not worthy to be able to ha handle some of that. What, what, what's your response to I that? How, how do you I put mean, some of those together? Of course Google's yeah. really smart, but there's yeah. a, smart people everywhere. And I don't think that's it. I think the issue is you know, Google had to build it for themselves, right? And they had to build it for search and build it for apps and build it for YouTube. And OpenStack's got a harder problem in a way when you think about it because they're building it for everybody. Right, and that was that was the Red Hat model as well. It's not just about building it for Goldman Sachs; it's building it for every vertical. And so it's supposed to be hard, right? It isn't just about like building a technology stack and saying we're done, we're going to move on. They have to, you know, the, this community has to make sure that it works, you know, across the industry. And that doesn't happen in six years, right? It takes a longer period of time to do that, and, and it just means, you know, keeping your focus on it, um, and then you deal with all the use cases you know, over time, and then you build, that's what getting to a unified, you know, commoditized platform delivers. Yeah, I, I, I love that, absolutely. We, we tend to oversimplify things, and right, you know, building from the ground up some infrastructure stack that can live in any data center is, right. is a big challenge. Simple to deploy, right. yeah. train the world. I wrote an article years ago <laughs> about, you know, Amazon hyper-optimizes. They only have to build for one data center, it's theirs. Yeah. They, yeah. You know, at Google, you understand what set of applications you're going to be running, you build your applications, and the infrastructure supports it uh, un underneath that. What are some of the big challenges you're working on? You know, some, some of the meaty things that are that are exciting you uh, in the technology space today. Um, I mean, it, it, in a way, it's similar, right? In a way, it's similar. It's just that at least our stacks are stack. Yeah. But what happens is then we have to marry that into you know the operational environments, um, not just for a niche of customers, but for every enterprise segment that's out there. And what you what you end up realizing is that it ends up becoming more of a competency challenge than a technology issue, because cloud is still, you know, public cloud is still really new, right? And, and I mean, it's consolidating, but it's still relatively new when you start to think about, you know, these journeys that happen, you know, in the, in the IT world. Um, so, so a lot of it for us is really that technical enablement of customers that want to get to Google Cloud, but how do you actually, you know, help them, right? And that, and so it's really a people and processes kind of conversation over a, 
how fast is your virtual machine? One of the things I think is interesting uh, about that Google Cloud that has developed is the uh, is the role of the SRE. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, Google has been you know, invented that, wrote the book on it. Literally, is training others, has partnerships to help train others uh, uh, with their SREs and the CRE program. Right. Uh, so much of uh, the people formerly known as sysadmins, you know, in this new cloud world, some of them are architects, but some of them will be end up being operators and, and, and SREs. Right. Right. How do you see the balance in this upskilling of? Uh, you know, kind of the architecture and the traditional infrastructure and capacities and app dev versus versus operations. How important is operations in our new world? It's everything. <laughs> and that's why I think people, you know, what's funny is that if you do this, this code handoff where the software developers build code and then they hand it to a team to run and deploy, the developers never become great at building systems that can be operationally managed and maintained. And so I think that was sort of the aha moment is the best I understand the SRE model at Google is that you know until you can actually deliver code that can be maintained and reliable, then the software developer owns that problem. The SRE organization only comes in you know, at that point in time where they hand ups there and they're software developers. Like they're, they're you know, every bit as skilled software developers as the engineers are that are building the code. It's just that that's the problem they want to decode, which I think is actually a harder problem than writing the code because when you think about it for a public cloud, is like, how do you actually make change, right? But keep the plane flying and make sure that it works with everything in an ecosystem at a period of time where you never really had a validation stage. Because in the land of sort of delivering ISV software, you always have this six month, you know, nine month validation phase to bring in a new operating system or something else or all the ecosystem tests around it. Cloud's harder. The magic of cloud is you don't have that window. Right, but you still have to guarantee the same results. And one of the things that we did around that was we took the page out of the SRE playbook, which is how does Google do it? And what we realized is that even though public clouds move the layer layers up, um, your enterprises still have the same issue because they're deploying you know critical applications and workloads on top. How do they do that? And how do they keep those workloads running? And what are their mechanisms for managing availability, service level objectives, you know, shared fake dashboards? And that's why we created you know, the CRE team, right? which is customer reliability engineering, which is a playbook off of SRE, but they work directly with end users. And that's part of the how do we help them get to Google Cloud. Part of it is like really understanding their application stacks and helping them build those operational procedures so they become SREs, if you will. Brian, one of the things I, I, if you look at OpenStack, it, it's really, it's the infrastructure layer that it handles. When I think about Google Cloud, where you, the area that you're, you're strongest, and you know, you're welcome to correct me, but it's really when we talk about data, how you use data, how uh, you know, analytics, uh, say some of the, you know, your leadership you're taking in, in the machine learning space. Um, is it okay for OpenStack to just handle those lower levels um, and let you know, other projects uh, sit on yeah. top of it? And cu curious as to you know, the, the developing where yeah. Google Cloud sits. I think that was a, a little bit of an aha moment for yeah. me, you know, even prior to Google was, was it was a, I, I did have a lens that it was all about infrastructure. And I think the infrastructure is every bit as important as it ever was. Um, but the fact that this, some of these services that don't exist in the on-premise world that live in Google Cloud are the ones that are transformative change. As opposed to just, you know, you know uh, giving you, you know, operational, you know, easing the operational burden, easing the security burden. But it's some of these add-on services that are the ones that really change your, you know, bring about business transformation. Um, the reason we, you know, have been moving away from Hadoop as an example, not entirely, but just because Hadoop's a batch-oriented yeah, application. Yeah, go to Spark, Flink, everything beyond. Sure, and yeah. then all of a sudden now, the, now when you get to real-time and streaming, it means you can have ingested data pipelines, and data come from multiple sources, but then you can action on that data instantly, and a lot of businesses require, ours certainly does, and I think a lot of our, our customers' d businesses do, um, the time to action um, really matters. And those are the types of services that at least at scale um, don't really exist anywhere else. And um, machine learning, um, the ability of our custom ASICs, you know, to support machine learning. So I don't, but I don't think it's a, it's a one versus the other. I think that brings about how do you allow enterprises to have both, right? And not have to choose between public cloud and on-premise or do I need services or do I need services? Because if you ask them, the best thing they could have is actually how do you marry the two environments together so they don't look, again, back to that impedance differences. Yeah, and I think that's a great point. We, we've talked, OpenStack is fitting into that hybrid or multi-cloud world yeah. a bunch. 
the, the challenge I guess we look at is some of those really cool features that are game changers that I have in public cloud that I can't do uh, you know, in, in my own data center. H how do we bridge that? Uh, they are started to see you know, the, the reach or the APIs sure. that do that, but h how do you see well, that playing out? Because you don't have to bring them in, because if you think about the fabric of IT, the fabric of IT is that you know, Google's data center in that way just becomes an extension of the data center that you know, a large enterprise is already using anyway. Right. So it's theirs, right? So they aren't going to see the lines of distinction. Only we, and sort of the IT side, see that. They're just going to be seeing, as long as they have a consistent platform, and they can take advantage of those services, and you know, it doesn't mean that their workload has to be portable and the services have to exist in both places. It's just a data extension with some pretty compelling services. Yeah, I, I think back, you know, Hadoop was, you know, let me bring the compute to the data because the data's big and can't be moved. Uh, yeah. Look at edge computing now, uh, I'm not going to be able to move all that data from the edge. I don't have the networking connectivity. There's certain pieces which will come back to, you know, a core or a public cloud, mm. but uh, I wonder if you could comment on some of those edge pieces, how you see that fitting in. We've talked a little bit about it here at Open Stack, but yeah, it's, Google. I mean, that, yeah. I think that's the evolution. Um, you know, when we when we look at, well, we just even see it at the edge of our network. The edge of our network is in it's 173 countries and regions globally, and so that you know that that edge of the network is, you know, full compute and caching, and so even for us, we're looking at like what sort of compute services do you bring to the edge of the network? Where like low latency really matters and proximity matters. Um, you know, the easiest obvious examples are gaming, but there's other ones as well in trading. Um, but still though, if you want to take advantage of that foundation, it shouldn't be one that you have to dive into a, the specificities of a single provider. You'd really want that abstraction layer across the edge, whether that's Docker and a defined set of APIs around data management and delivery and, and, and security. That probably gives you that, you know, that edge computing sort of cell. And then you really want to build around that on you know, Google's edge. You want to build around that on a telco's edge. So I don't think it really becomes necessarily around whether it's centralized or it's the edge, it's really what's that architecture to deliver. All right, uh, Brian, want to give you the opportunity, f final word, things, uh, you know, either from you know, OpenStack retrospectively or you know, Google looking forward uh, that they'd like to leave our audience with. Um, wow, closing remarks. You know, I mean, I think, it's, I think the continuity here is open source, right? And I, and I know the backdrop of this is OpenStack, but it's really around open source is the you know the accepted foundation and substrate for IT computing up the stack. So I think that's not changing. The faces may change, and what we call these projects may change. Um, but that's the evolution, and I think there's really no turning back on that now. Brian Stevens, always a pleasure to cap up, catch up with you. We'll be back with lots more coverage here with the Cube. Thanks for watching. <laughs>